see him there the great I am a crown of thorns upon his head the father's heart displayed for us oh God we thank you for the cross Lifted up on Calvary's hill, we cursed your name, and even still, you bore our shame and paid the cost. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, You will reign forevermore. The victory is Yours. We sing Your praise, endless hallelujahs to Your holy name. Jesus, You For every sin, our Savior died. The Lord of life can't be contained. Our God has risen from the grave. Oh, our God has risen from the grave. the sun will bow before the King of Kings oh God forever we will sing behold the Lamb the story of redemption written on his hands Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption in all his sins. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Easter. He is risen. We welcome you to Chapel Gate in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came, who died, and who three days after he was buried, rose again. My name's Mike Kanjan. I'm one of the pastors here. 
Uh, if you're visiting with us, that actually wasn't for you. Our church has never seen me in a suit. So I'm just letting them know. Julie came up to me a while ago and said, I didn't even recognize you. I look in the mirror, I don't even recognize me. There's a story behind it. I'll tell it sometime. But we're so honored to be able to worship him with you. We have no announcements other than to say that Jesus lives and that we pray that he ministers his grace to you as we worship together uh, as one. Welcome. Before we sing together, uh, we're going to say this call to worship. It's responsive. I'll say the first part, and then if y'all would respond with the bold. This is what it says. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen, and the demons are fallen. Christ is risen and life reigns. Christ is risen and not one death remains in the grave. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. He is risen indeed. Would you all stand and sing this first song with us? This is Praise the King. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Praise the King. Oh 
from Romans 8 before we sing this next song. This is what it says. Be reminded today that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is it was finished upon that cross.
Good morning. My name is Steve Dalwig. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's uh, my joy uh, to lead us in prayer this morning. At the conclusion of my prayer, I'll ask that you join me as we recite the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, our hearts are just overcome with joy and gratitude as we gather before you, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Um, Father, we come as your children, united in faith, Lord, and in the gospel, and we come in awe that the tomb is empty and that Jesus is risen. Father, because the tomb is empty, we have hope in the midst of life's trials and tribulations. Lord, we can cling to the promise of Easter that death has been conquered and that new life awaits all who believe. Lord, our hope is not in vain for Christ has risen. Lord, because the tomb is empty, death does not have the final word. And though death's shadow may at times loom large, it holds no power over those who are in Christ. Father, your victory over the grave has shattered the chains of death, offering us the assurance of life with you and all of those um, for all time who have put their faith in you. And Father, because the tomb is empty, your church and your kingdom will grow. Empowered by the resurrection, Father, we are called to go and make disciples of all nations, proclaiming the good news of salvation to the very ends of the earth. And as we bear witness in our lives and our love and our words to your transformative power, Lord, may your church expand, may it flourish, and may people be drawn from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Father, we know, Lord, that through Jesus we have one who intercedes before your throne on our behalf. And so this morning, we lift up all who have been deeply affected, Lord, by this week's collapse of the Key Bridge. Lord, we lift up the families of those whose lives were lost, Lord, the pilots and the crew of the ship, Lord, for uh, the many first responders, for our doctors, for our nurses, for our police, Lord, so many have been involved, so many have been affected. Lord, grant them... Lord, your presence, your grace, your peace. Father, may your church be a light even in the midst of this in our city. Lord, for those in our congregation who are sick, who are facing or recovering from surgery, for those whose struggle may not even be physical, Lord, but emotional or spiritual, Lord, be with them all. Bring the peace and presence, Lord, of your spirit and the gospel and bring the healing and relief they long for and they need. Gracious Father, as we continue our worship today, may we be ever mindful of the empty tomb and the powerful implications it holds for our lives. Strengthen our faith, Lord. Empower us to live as your resurrection people, bearing witness in our communities, our cities, and our world. And now, Father, we pray as our Savior Jesus has taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Um, I'm Jordan Woodrick. I'm going to lead us in a confession of faith using some ancient words from Ignatius of Antioch. Um, please join with me as we read them responsively. I'll start and you all will respond with a bold. Jesus Christ was descended from the family of David and born of Mary. He truly was born both of God and of the Virgin. He truly took a body, for the word became flesh and dwelt among us without sin. He ate and drank truly, truly suffered persecution under Pontius Pilate, was truly crucified and died. 
He was also truly raised from the dead and rose after three days as his father raised him up. After having spent 40 days with the apostles, he was received up to the father and sits on his right hand, waiting till his enemies are put under his feet. My name is Phil Hoyos, and this is my story. As a kid, I grew up in a home where we believed in God, but we never went to church. We never talked about faith and talked about religion. Um, many of my early interactions with church were through things like VBS, um, but I never really had a desire to pursue God. So when I was 10 years old, my father passed away on the first day of sixth grade. And I remember having just this anger towards God um, because I would hear believers say things like, God has a plan for everything. And to my young mind, that meant that his plan for me was to grow up without a father. And I really wanted no part of a relationship with a God who did that. So a couple years went by and a friend of my parents invited my mom and I to a Christmas Eve service, and then we started attending a church regularly. At this point, I was still very skeptical um, and would often just sit through the service and then run out to the car and just kind of wait for my mom to come out so that I didn't have to engage with anyone. The summer before ninth grade, a guy that I'd met at church invited me to attend a week-long Christian camp out in Pennsylvania, and I agreed to go. At this camp, I had the opportunity to hear from my counselors about the struggles that they themselves had had in their life and how our Heavenly Father still provided for them in ways that they just couldn't have imagined. That really resonated with me, and it was then that I believe I started my walk with God. Over the next few years, I continued to attend camp in the summer while becoming more involved at church and growing my faith. I eventually um, became one of the counselors at this camp and served on staff in various capacities over the course of about 10 years. During that time, I met my wife um, and she had also attended camp as a camper and was now a staff member um, at the same time as I was and uh, we started dating and eventually got married. After the birth of our first son, and as we prepare for the arrival of our second son at the end of May, I've thought a lot about um, how God's plans for us are really like a loving father watching over his children. Anyone who has ever, you know, raised a four-year-old knows that one of their favorite questions has got to be, why? And at some point as parents, we all say, because I said so. I find myself reflecting on the last 25 years of my life and wondering if I hadn't lost my dad, would I have been invited to church? Would I have gone to that camp and accepted Christ? Would I have met my wife and have the family that I do now? Point is this. We may not understand the path that we're being led down, and sometimes it is extremely painful. But in the end, our Father loves us, and He is with us through all of it. You know, Phil was a friend of many of us, he's a friend of us in state, and he's been with us uh, for probably more than 10 years now. And I'm so thankful for his willingness to share something so painful out of his past, but also the redemptive part of it. And I couldn't help but think how his story really echoed what we're celebrating this weekend, the awfulness of Friday and the, and the glory and the wonder of today. So with that in your minds, would you stand and sing this next song with us? This is Crowning with Many Crowns. Thy matchless King 
And we ask now that as Mike brings us the gospel, you'd open up our hearts and give us the ears to hear it. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. My name is Nicholas. I'm a Chapelgate Church member, Chapelgate Christian Academy alumni, 2010, and also currently helping with the new members class, uh, Discovery class. It's so nice to be here with you today, both as a greeter and now a reader. Uh, it's great to serve the church and the house of the Lord. Uh, it's so wonderful to be with you this morning. This morning, I'll be reading John 20, 11 through 18 in the ESV. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, that she turned around and saw Jesus coming, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have laid him so they may find so I, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciple, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, it's been great to worship here with you this morning. Uh, I pray that the risen Christ meets you where you are. And uh, I just uh, thought the testimony was, was beautiful. Just really thankful for it. Uh, pray with me. Jesus, thank you that you have come. Thank you for the promise of the new heavens and the new earth, for life beyond the grave, for the sacrifice you made for us. Now speak to us in spite of the sins and insecurities and failings of the one who delivers the message that we may know you. For we pray in your name, amen. You may have heard the story of the, the man who uh, took his wife and mother-in-law on a once-in-a-lifetime trip to Israel, obviously not in the last few months. And um, he had it all planned out. It was just going to be perfect. The, the, the food, the restaurants, the tour, the sites, uh, everything they would do, the order that they would do it in. And it really was perfect, but nothing was good enough for his mother-in-law. First time I ever told this story, Catherine was a mother-in-law, so I hope I'm okay with her after it. But anyways, uh, she complained the whole time. She thought the food was second rate. She thought the uh, accommodations were, were not that good. She didn't like the order of the sites they went into. And it turned out to be a miserable trip for him. Then about a day before they left for the States, inexplic inexplicably, she died. They took her to the funeral home and the funeral director said, listen, this happens from time to time and either uh, you can let us bury her uh, and it would be a beautiful historic site in Israel and it would be about $150 or you will have to ship her back to the States and it'll be about $5,000 before you have to even go through the other costs. Without thinking a second, he says, ship her to the States. The guy's dumbfounded. He says, no one's ever said that. He said, why would you want to spend that kind of money? And he goes, listen, 2,000 years ago, some guy died and he was alive three days later. I'm not taking that chance. My apologies to every mother-in-law everywhere. This morning, we have the privilege of proclaiming to you the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The Apostle Paul says that he is the first fruits among those who have fallen asleep. And that was, that was his way of describing those who belong to Jesus when they die, that it's merely sleep from which we will wake up from. And the promise is that we will awaken to life eternal. My hope is that your assurance would be 
in the work of Jesus. Solomon says in Proverbs 14, 32, the righteous find refuge in their death. And that's certainly the case with Tim Keller, who died last year, one of the foremost preachers and theologians of our day. Towards the end of his life, among his last words, were the words, there is no downside for me leaving, not in the slightest. And Lynn McNeil's cousin Susan, who recently passed away, who knew the Lord, and among her last words were face to face. Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 26, 19 says, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. We believe that Jesus died and that on the third day after he was buried, he rose from the dead. We couldn't be a church if we didn't believe this. There's no way that our message would have any credibility if it weren't true that Jesus died and rose. Paul said it would be foolish to do this. It'd be lunacy. Next week, we'll, Catherine and I will be in Tallahassee. And one of my best friends died several weeks ago. And we will, we will bury him. And I can't imagine doing a service if I didn't believe there was hope beyond the grave. I can't imagine preaching the good news if it were not really good news. I can't imagine my own life and body aging and thinking that there's nothing beyond this life, nothing beyond the highs and the lows and anything else. One day, face to face, as Susan said, we will be with Jesus. Now, if you read up on the, on the resurrection, you'll find all kinds of arguments as to why it is true, but no mountain of evidence ever convinced a single heart. However, for those who encountered the risen Christ, everything changed. Everything changed with the resurrection, and it still does. The resurrection is for those who have given up and for those who have lost hope, for those who wonder if God even knows that they exist. It's for Christians as well as unbelievers who have forgotten that the, the, pow the power of God's grace and the wonder of God's forgiveness. It is for those who fear death and for those who feel dead inside. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is the allegorical picture that C.S. Lewis wrote of, of the Christian life, in a series called The Chronicles of Narnia, he paints the Christ figure as an, a lion named Aslan and the Satan figure as a white witch. Within the white witch's estate are, uh, is a courtyard that's filled with statues of people and animals uh, that she cursed and made them frozen. But the resurrection narrative of the story, after Jesus is killed by the white witch, I mean, excuse me, Aslan is killed by the white witch and comes back to life, he rises and he goes to the courtyard and he breathes on the statues. And they also all come to life immediately. It isn't only the dead that Jesus breathes life into. His resurrection means that he has the power to breathe life into dying marriages and hope into disheartened souls and joy into dispirited hearts and comfort into lonely people and horizons of beauty beyond the wreckage of broken dreams and past disappointments. Now, our passage finds Mary Magdalene in the garden where Jesus' tomb was and where he lay. Jesus had cast seven demons out of Mary, and she became his lifelong devoted follower. And the gospel writer Mark tells us that she actually was the first person to see Jesus alive physically and the first person that he sent to tell others that he was alive. Initially, upon looking in the grave, Mary believed that Jesus' body was stolen. She went to Peter and to, and to John and told them who rushed to the tomb and found that it was empty and then rushed out without even speaking with her. And when Mary looked in, all she saw were angels sitting at either side of where Jesus' body lay. And they asked her why she was weeping. And once again, she told them that someone had taken the body of Jesus and moved it because the last thing on her mind was resurrection. Now we understand this, don't we? We understand what it's like when guilt torments us, and the last thing we believe is that we could ever be forgiven. I've been there. When coldness paralyzes hearts, the last thing we believe is that there can be re renewed love. 
and when we think it's impossible to imagine that we can have a restored name or a hopeful way forward or a repaired life. You see, we expect worse, not better. That was Mary. That would be us. John uses the language of lament to describe what happens. Mary wept. She cried. She mourned. She grieved. But as she does, when she was at her lowest and most hopeless, a stranger appears who asks her why she's crying. It's Jesus. But she thinks he's the gardener. And she just assumes that he took the body out of the grave, which, you know, technically was true, but not because of the way, reason she thought it was. And she demands that he tell him, tell her where he is, she has put him so that she can care for the body. But rather than do that, the garden, see, gardener, seeing that Mary doesn't recognize him, says her name, Mary. And immediately she knew that Jesus was risen and alive. In his book, How to Know a Person, David Brooks says that there are all kinds of things that are going to come out of artificial intelligence. Many things for the next few decades, that, including tasks that humans uh, that are doing, uh, are doing now will not be doing in the future. But the one thing that he says that will never die and that it will never be able to replace is the ability to create person-to-person -person connections. And I read an example of this in the New York Times last week with the, rising, with the rise of student absenteeism in our schools across the country, which has resulted in a dearth of human connections. These kids that are not going to class at an alarming rate don't know how to socialize like they once did. And it's led to all kinds of disciplinary situations in the classroom when they do, even violence. When Adam sinned in the garden, the connections that God designed for the entire universe to, dis to enjoy with him, with one another, and with the creation that he, that he placed him in were shattered. But in the garden tomb, the curse was reversed because of the resurrection. And because Jesus is alive, we, as Tolkien said, will witness that everything sad will one day come untrue. And until that day happens, we find hope in the risen Jesus who enters into our brokenness as he did to Mary when she was sad. He didn't wait for her to feel better. He didn't wait for her to get herself together. He didn't wait for her to dry up her tears. He entered into her brokenness and he who knows and, and knew her name as he does ours and calls us by that. Mary was looking for a corpse in the garden of life. And this is why the disciples didn't believe her when she told them that Jesus was alive. And because they, they had to see him for himse themselves. Because in each case, those who knew that Jesus were al was alive were people that he came to and not the other way around. He came to the disciples who were fishing in the Sea of Galilee. He came to the disciples who were hiding in a, in a building for fear that they would be arrested. He came to the disciples who were on their way to, uh, to Emmaus, and he came to Mary in the garden. You see, it isn't on you to make yourself believe in Jesus, but to recognize that the desire that you have for more. Even your resistance of Jesus may be signs that he's walking beside you, meeting you where you are in life, making himself known through some crisis, some crossroads, some season of sorrow or period or deep loneliness. Each person that Jesus met after the resurrection drama needed for him to come to them to find them where they were, and so do we. Paul says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But don't try and manufacture a faith that you can't construct. Saving faith is a gift. It begins with a yearning that we can't explain. And start there for something that's beyond your grasp 
that pursuit that you've sought in other things that never delivered. Resist until you realize that something otherworldly, something beautiful beckons you. Lewis wrote, the fact that our heart yearns for something earth can't supply is proof that heaven must be our home. Be like Mary. I love her holy dissatisfaction. Resist until you realize that it's Jesus who's stirring you, troubling your heart, and, 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 your, and stirring your, your assumptions, like Mary, for whom the angels were done on enough. Even this stranger that she thought was a gardener who was not enough until he was. Resist until you could do no other but believe. Because one day you'll realize you were resisting. There had to be someone the risen Jesus comes to us where we are, transcending our unbelief, convicting us of sin, assuring us that forgiveness, healing, renewal, and peace, and life await. Only pride will deprive you of unspeakable joy. In 1981, the Irish Republican Army detonated a car bomb in Belfast where the first Lisbon Presbyterian Church stood. The place was trashed. The windows, the stained glass windows were shattered. It did unspeakable damage to the shops in the area. And in the aftermath, the congregation of that church decided to take all the shards of the stained glass and commission an artist to restore one of the windows, which he did. At the center of the window is the earth, surrounded by the red of, and covered with the red of blood and suffering and sin and sorrow. Beams of light radiate outwards from the globe, and palm branches of peace are woven in and out of the beams of light. It was reconstructed nearly entirely out of otherwise unusable fragments from the bombing. And it stands as a declaration of that church of the power of the resurrection to bring life out of death and to heal all things and make them right. I know that at times you feel like you are an unusable shard of glass because I do too. The gospel finds us where we're broken. Jesus said, I didn't come to heal the healthy, but the sick. Jesus comes where we are broken. Only the resurrection can bring beauty out of the wreckage of our lives. And now, scarred with the reminders of the cost of our redemption, Jesus transforms the shattered places of our lives into stories of wholeness and joy. Jesus, the risen King, the eternal one, the author of our salvation and ruler of the kings of the earth who is worthy of the courses of the angels and every living being was born to die, but sin couldn't break him. Death couldn't conquer him. The grave couldn't contain him. He ascended and he's exalted and he invites us to himself to believe what he said in John 5, 24, that those who do cross over from death to life before they die, before it's too late, they begin to live like they were created to live before Adam and Eve failed in the garden. You see, the, the, the gospel repairs us for eternity in the moment that we believe. I love what Solomon says in the Song of Solomon 2. Behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. And the voice of the turler, turtle dove is heard in our land. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come awake. Come awake, come and rise up from the grave. George Herbert wrote, Rise heart, thy Lord is risen. All glory, praise, and honor to Jesus our King. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Jesus, you who came and entered into our brokenness, we praise your name and we thank you that you didn't wait till we got it all together. But you found us where we were at our worst, and you meet us there. And if there are any in here who don't know you, 
I pray, Lord, that today would be the day of their salvation where they flee to you in faith and they cross over from death to life in the assurance that Mary had that you had, that you had rescued, delivered her. And oh God, for those of us who belong to you, who have forgotten the wonder of our salvation, who have lost sight of the reality of your forgiveness, who have forgotten that you enter into broken places and make them right, forgive us. We thank you, we praise you, and Jesus, to you, we give all our praise and glory and honor, for we pray in your name, amen. Would you all stand and sing with us one more time? your life for mine nailed to the cross you crucified all my sin and shame was washed by your mercy you are the treasure I find my reason for living so let my life Come and offering to the one who is worthy. All praise to the Lord Most High. All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven. My King forever You storm the gates of my heart The veil in between was torn apart Now you hold the keys to the grave Cause you bring things to life all stones away All praise to the Lord most high All praise to the one who saved my life All praise to Jesus Christ My King of heaven, my King forever All praise to the Lord most high All praise
save my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever. Oh, amen. Could you imagine writing music and words like that to a dead king? Wow, beautiful. Who else but the living Jesus could change a 10-year-old's life who lost his dad into a story of redemption as he raises his own sons? Oh, sheesh, about 35 or 40 years ago when we were in our second year of ministry in Tallahassee, our church was little. There were about 60 in it. It was on a little, in a little building. They could hardly hold people and coffee at the same time. And uh, on a little piece of property, and we wanted to have that church's first ever vacation Bible school for kids in the community. We knew that if we had it, kids would come. But we didn't have the means. We didn't have the money. We didn't have the resources. We hardly had the room. We didn't have the rooms. So I went to the local funeral home and asked them, if we could use their, their cemetery tents, you know, like you go a graveside for a week. And they, they not only said yes, but they came and set them up for us, and they tore them down. And for a whole week, the Beavis Funeral Home served as a benefactor of life. For a week, it didn't dig funeral hole, get grave holes. It served as a benefactor of life for dozens of children who came and enjoyed Bible school. They turned their work into the work of the Garden of Life. Jesus has come. He's alive, and he beckons you to himself. This is the gospel, our good news. And we're so thankful that you came to worship with us. We hope you'll call us if you need a thing. We're as close as your phone, and we desire to minister to you in his name. And if you want to be prayed with or pray with someone, we have folks at the table up here who would love to do so. You may not even want to say anything. You may just want them to pray. But we have no greater joy than to see people come to know Jesus. And we hope you'll call between now and next week. We're as close as your phone. And we desire to minister in Christ's name to you. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, even Christ Jesus, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. May you go in his peace because he has come for you in time. He was born for you in the flesh. He died for you on the cross. He was buried for you in the grave. He has risen and he is coming for you to make all things, and make, as he makes all things new. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless you.